Welcome to Can't Make This Up, a history podcast where we talk to authors and historians of unique and unusual history. I am your host, Kevin. Happy Memorial Day to all of my American listeners. Uh, Hopefully, whether you are still staying indoors or whether you are venturing out to enjoy the nice weather, I hope that you are safe and healthy no matter where you are. Well, today I could not be more excited. We are going to talk about a subject that interests me incredibly. It has since I was a kid. Today we're going to blend several of the things that I find incredibly exciting. History, science, astronomy, science fiction. I can't wait. So let me ask you a basic, fundamental question. Are we alone in the universe? Think about that for a second. Since humans first began gazing up into the cosmos, we have tried to answer this question, sometimes using theology and sometimes philosophy. In our literature, particularly in the science fiction genre, we have speculated on what contact with otherworldly beings could look like. In recent centuries, we have used science and our ever-increasing advances in technology to look out into the heavens and search for telltale signs that someone else is out there. Studying the stars for alien life has a long and interesting history, most notably with the founding of SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, nearly 60 years ago. My guest today is Keith Cooper, author of The Contact Paradox, challenging our assumptions in the search for extraterrestrial intelligence who joins me to discuss the history surrounding academic efforts of seeking out new life and new civilizations. Keith has a background in astronomy and astrophysics, and has served as the editor of Astronomy Now since 2006. His articles on cosmology, planetary science, astrobiology, and related disciplines have appeared in Sky and Telescope, Physics World, and the Journal of the British Interplanetary Society. In our conversation, Keith and I discuss early searches for ET intelligence and the origins of the SETI program, what SETI has done to listen for signals from other worlds, and the controversy surrounding the idea of whether or not we should respond if we do indeed intercept an alien signal. Keith and I then dive into our own evolutionary history to speculate on how life might have evolved elsewhere, and we explore examples from Earth's history of first contact between cultures to see what lessons we might be able to apply to first contact with an extraterrestrial civilization. Now on to the show. The You Can't Make This Up History Podcast, bringing you strange but true things from the past. It's not the average history that you learned in school. We're bringing you the heroes and bringing you the fools. And stories that are just too crazy to believe. The stranger than fiction and super unique. Hello, Keith Cooper. Thank you so much for coming on the program today. It's a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Um, Well, um, you are the author of The Contact Paradox, Challenging Our Assumptions in the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. And, you know, while maybe on the face of it, it doesn't seem like uh, something for a history podcast, there is a lot of really good history in there. I found this to be a really fascinating book. (laughs) <laughs> that, that's a relief that it's got good history and as uh, as um you know the title of the book suggests it, it's it, it's not specifically a history book and, and i'm not a historian i'm i'm a an astronomer a physicist from my background um so a lot of the the history material that was in the book uh a lot of that was new to me so i'm, I'm glad that i i got it all right um but yeah it's it's you know it's a book about SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, about looking for um, intelligent or te- technological life, you know, on planets around other stars. But as I wrote it, the thing that really struck home was that it almost doesn't matter if we find life out there or not, because just doing the search and understanding what that life may be like can teach us so much about our own life and our own history and our own culture and where we may go in the future. Um, So that's where the history aspect um, came in, uh, looking at things like different contact events between societies here on Earth 
um, and our evolutionary history from you know the origin of life and the origin of intelligence. And yeah, it's, it's just, there's a phrase I use in the book that the stars are like a mirror and we look to the stars and we see ourselves reflected back. And I learned so much about you know human history and human culture from just writing the book and that I hope uh, people reading the book will also learn a lot. Well, let's start with you. You've mentioned that you're an, an astronomer professionally. Um, so what is it about astronomy uh, that inspired you to, to pursue a career in science journalism? Yeah, so, so I'm, not, I'm, I'm not a professional astronomer. I, I studied um, astrophysics at, at university, but I didn't, after graduating, I, I didn't pursue uh, a, a, an academic career. Um, I always loved writing ever since I was a, a child. I always found writing easier than maths, which <laughs> may have influenced my my career choice. Um, but, you know, I've always been fascinated in the universe uh, around us, um, you know, and other planets and other galaxies. I, you know, science fiction has been really a core part of my life growing up and into adulthood. I can appreciate uh, that. Yeah, so, so you, know, you combine those two things together and, you know, out pops an interest in, in extraterrestrial life. Um, not interested in things like UFOs. I'm not convinced by UFO accounts, but the scientific search for extraterrestrial life, and what you know, what implications that could have for us, uh, it seems a rather profound field of study. So yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I edit an astronomy magazine over here in the UK. So you know, I write all about black holes and galaxies and other planets and things. But you know, as I said, writing this book has really opened my eyes to. Um, other things about you know about our own history as well. Yeah, and it, it should be mentioned uh, what we're going to talk about today um, isn't um, you know supposed UFO phenomenon. We're we're talking more in an academic sense on what the history's been for the um, more rigid scientific search for extraterrestrial life. <laughs> Well, well, let me describe a little bit about what SETI is, because people may confuse it with, with UFO. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, what is SETI, and, and yeah, where, where did it come from? Yeah, so so modern SETI, um, if anybody has seen the movie Contact, uh, based on the Carl Sagan novel uh, starring Jodie Foster, they'll be familiar with you know astronomers using radio telescopes to listen to, to uh, the stars for, for signals from alien life out there. And that's basically what SETI is. It's, it's the hypothesis that we are not alone in the universe, that life has evolved on other planets. Um, the distances between the stars are vast, many, many light years. Um, there's no known way to cross those distances in any sort of decent time. So the assumption is that aliens won't try and come here, but they may try to uh, send us messages um, that would travel at the speed of light across space. And uh, scientists looked at this and thought, well, the best way to send messages is using radio technology. Um, they concluded this uh, back in the late 1950s, uh, when you know, radio technology was really maturing after the Second World War. Um, radio astronomy especially was coming into its own. Um, you had the big uh, telescopes at Jodrell Bank, for example, or at Green Bank. And so SETI is basically just, just listening for those kind of signals. Um, in, in recent years, we've also started looking for laser signals because obviously lasers are an important part of telecommunications here on Earth. So why wouldn't you know, a technologically advanced civilization possibly also use lasers to uh, send messages to us as well? We, we can already build lasers that can shine briefly brighter than the sun. Um, so a, a slightly more advanced, technologically advanced civilization would probably you know be able to to create a laser that could send us messages um, across many light years um, we also look for you know uh, I don't know if, if a civilization was really technologically advanced that they may build artifacts around their stars that could block the stars light things like a Dyson sphere which listeners may have heard of um, it was uh, described by the the late physicist Freeman Dyson this idea of building a sphere of solar collectors around a star to collect all the energy from a star that a civilization then may want to use. So, so yeah, it's about looking for, for those kind of things as opposed to, uh, you know, UFOs and, and little green men or whatever. Um, SETI doesn't, if you talk to some of the, the SETI researchers, they don't rule out the possibility that maybe a civilization would send robotic probes 
to our solar system, the way that we send robotic probes to planets in, in our solar system, it, they would take a, a very long time to reach us. But, it, you know, it's, it's possible. So there's a little bit of blurring of the lines there between ufology and, and SETI, but mostly SETI is concerned with looking for or listening to these radio signals. And, and that all began back in 1960 with the first SETI radio experiment by Frank Drake called Project Osma. And he listened to two nearby stars uh, for a couple of weeks. Uh, and on, I think in the fir- on the first day, he actually detected a signal. I mean, he must have thought, <laughs> this is really easy. It turned out to be... Yeah, it turned out to be a U-2 spy plane uh, high, high overhead. It's, it's had a long life as SETI, and, and people say, why, why haven't we found anything yet? It's been going on 60 years. Um, but the answer to that, to that is that the universe is vast, and we've barely scratched the surface. There's a, an analogy that if, you know, if the universe were the size of the Pacific Ocean, we've sort of searched the equivalent of you know, a, mug, a mug full of, of water for, for life. So, so, yeah, there's a long way to go. So, it, since it started in, in the early 60s, um, has SETI discovered uh, any evidence at all of an extraterrestrial civilization, or, or at least um, possible evidence? Not really. Um, there was one signal in 1977 called the WOW signal, and that was uh, detected by the Big Ear Telescope in Ohio, I believe. I, I don't think the telescope exists, and exists anymore. Um, yeah, that, that it, was here in Ohio. I, I right, yeah, yeah. So it was an automated system. So every couple of days, a scientist or technician would go up to the observatory and collect all the printouts. It was on all that, you know, the old style printer paper with the, the perforated edges and reams and reams of the stuff. Uh, and, and one day, uh, an astronomer called Jerry Amon, it was his job to go up and collect the readouts, and he was just perusing them before heading back uh, to the to the office. And he, all of a sudden, he saw this signal on on the printout that was the strongest narrow band radio signal he'd ever seen. And he wrote wrote "Wow" in the margin, so that's where the name comes from. Um, it was never seen again. It wasn't a message; it was just a, a blast of raw radio energy. Um, it lasted for a couple of minutes, and then disappeared. Uh, nobody knows what it was, where it came from, whether it was a natural phenomenon or whether it was artificial, whether it was terrestrial interference. Um, but, you know, that it has, has grown into a kind of a SETI legend um, over the last uh, 43 years. Um, and I think that's probably been the best evidence. Um, nothing else has come close to that. So, you know, some people may lose there was a hope, you know, searching for all that time and not finding very much, but it, it's very much a long-term project. And I think if you ask any SETI scientist, they'll admit that, you know, it, it could be beyond their lifetime uh, before we ever find a signal. So, yeah, so we haven't found any, any, anything conclusive, just tantalizing bits and pieces, which could be anything. Now, like, like you mentioned, um, there are some inherent problems in trying to find intelligent life beyond our solar system. Yeah, oh, I mean, gosh, there's all kinds of assumptions that we make, and we don't know whether those assumptions are correct. So let's break apart what SETI is looking for. It's looking for intelligent, technological life. I mean, we don't know, for example, whether intelligence inevitably leads to technology. Maybe human life on Earth is an oddball, and maybe most life in the universe is intelligent, like dolphins or chimps or, or whatever, but you know, it never never invents technology, um, in which case we would never discover them, certainly not, you know, listening with radio telescopes. The other assumption is that intelligence of any kind is, is common. Um, and, and again, we don't know that. We, you know, we only have life on Earth as the only example of how evolution uh, how proceeds and, and how intelligence evolves. And it could be that intelligence is, is really rare. Um, but, we, you know, we have to think, what is intelligence? And, and I think Often people will think that the only intelligent civilization, on, or only intelligent life on Earth is, is human life. But as I mentioned, dolphins are intelligent, um, chimps are intelligent, whales, um, all kinds of animals have, have different kinds of intelligence. So SETI can get very parochial sometimes. Often, they, often I feel SETI is just looking for a, hu- a future version of human civilization. Uh, and I think we have to broaden our horizons and consider other kinds of, of life and how that m- then may affect our chances of success in SETI. 
So we're kind of projecting this um, um, human-centric uh, view of what life should look like into the yeah. universe. Absolutely, and, and you know we can we can see that in, in science fiction. I mean, you know, if you look, if you're a Star Trek fan, you know, Klingons and the Romulans and, and the Vulcans, and they, they all tend to exemplify some facet of, of human behavior. SETI kind of does that a little bit, and I, I can understand why because. You know, you have to start somewhere. So why not start with what you know? But if, you know, if we if we look back at our own evolution um, and understand how that happened, then we can begin to ask questions about whether it will happen the same way on other planets, or whether evolution will take a different trajectory and, and wind up with some other kind of intelligence or some other kind of life that we haven't thought of, and that could inform you know our search. So, you know, let, let's, let's go back to, to, to life on Earth and the origin of life. We don't know yet how life originated on planet Earth. We have some good ideas, but there's, you know, there's no firm conclusion um, of how or where life arose. But once it did, it, it certainly seemed to spread out across the planet pretty quickly. And if we look at the tree of life, all life on Earth today is related to um, an organism called the last universal common ancestor, or LUCA, um, which is some kind of microbial life that existed about 3.8 billion years ago. Um, that LUCA may not have been the first kind of life, but it was the ancestor of all life here on Earth. And if there were any other kinds of life at the same time, they've probably died out um, just to leave, um, you know, sort of the, the, the genetic legacy of, of Luca in, in, in life that exists on Earth now. Um, then you had sort of the diversification of life from, you know, single-celled uh, organisms uh, like bacteria, uh, the, the evolution of them into eukaryotic cells that allowed uh, multicellular life and complex life to begin to evolve. And I think that all these eukaryotic fossils are about 1.7 billion years old, but there's some evidence that they may have existed for almost twice as long as that. But for, for most of Earth's history, life on Earth has been dominated by, you know, microbial life. Um, until about 500 million years ago, when, when life came out of the oceans and you had something called the Cambrian Explosion. Um, nobody knows exactly what caused this, but it was a great outburst of complexity and evolution. And you suddenly found all these weird and wonderful life forms evolving. And from that, there's come this debate in evolution about how life evolves. So Stephen Jay Gould, a uh, famous evolutionary biologist, he, he, he argued for, for evolution to be contingent, that once it develops a, a particular solution, it never replicates that solution again. Um, and he based that on all these weird and wonderful forms and, you know, and the fossils found from you know, in, in rocks dating back to the Cambrian explosion, because he said, well, life like, doesn't look anything like that on Earth today, you know, so evolution found uh, a solution to whatever um, problem it, it was faced with, and, and, and that life evolved, but it didn't replicate that solution anywhere else in evolution. The other um, side of the coin is the idea that evolution is, inc is convergent, that actually life does, it, it, sorry, that evolution does replicate solutions you know how many times have eyes evolved how many times have wings evolved things like that um so then when we look, when we look at intelligence and how intelligence evolved is intelligence a contingent solution in evolution in that it has evolved once uh, and and never will again um or, or is it a convergent solution to evolution uh in which you know life all over Earth and all over the universe could consistently evolve intelligence and technological intelligence. So there's that big debate about whether, you know, our kind of intelligence is, is going to be unique in the universe or whether it's going to be replicated elsewhere. So in um, that and case, it's kind of an inevitable outcome. Sure, yeah, yeah. If it's a convergent solution, then, then it would seem to be not, not necessarily inevitable, but certainly a common outcome. But if it's a contingent solution, then it may be very rare, and we may be alone as the uh, as the the only planet that has you know complex intelligent life. You may have heard of something called the Great Filter, um, which is this idea that there is something um, in nature that prevents 
um, life from evolving. It's, it's, it's a way to explain why we may be the only uh, life in the universe. And one possibility is that there's the development of, of complex life, of eukaryotic cells that allow multicellular life to evolve could be a, a bit of a bottleneck for evolution. And we managed to fluke our way through that. Um, but on other worlds, life may never um, progress further than, than single-celled organisms. So there's all these you know, questions kind of up in the air. And until we find you know, life on other planets or, or we have some... Um, archaeological uh this discovery of you know fossils that, that filling some of these missing links um we're kind of just making assumptions and guessing uh, in a way making educated guesses not not random guesses but you know we, we don't have an answer really as to whether whether life on earth is unique or, or not yet we're uh, we're a, and, and i think you say this in the book we're, we're a data set of one and yes, it's very exactly. difficult to make predictions from a data set of one. Yes, yeah. So, so you know, when we do SETI, it's it's not just about looking for little green men. You know, finding life out there, you know, even even if it's just finding microbial life on 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 Mars, um, you know, that would have a profound effect on us because it would help inform us about where where we came from and how we evolved, and and that maybe we're not a fluke, because. You know, if life on Earth is, is, is unique in the universe, then that's a huge responsibility on our shoulders not to um, wipe ourselves out. Because if we did, then we'd be snuffing out the only example of intelligent or complex life in the whole universe. Uh, I, I've recently been reading a book by Toby Ord from the Future of Humanity Institute at the University of Oxford uh, called The Precipice. And it's all about existential risks and and the um, the threat that humanity faces that we could you know end up wiping ourselves out. Um, and if we did that, um, and there is no other life out there, then, you know, that would be, you know, wherever, uh, you know, our future could take us, that potential would just be wiped out for life in the universe everywhere if we we're alone. So, yeah, the big stakes, I think. So, you know, life could, uh, assuming life is out there, it could look in uh, look like all kinds of different unrecognizable forms to us. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, astronomers and historians have, have thought about at least, you know, what could a intelligent civilization look like? And how have they mm -hmm. looked at human culture and human history and human values to try to predict what we could encounter out there. Let's go back before sort of you know, the 1600s and the advent of um, Copernicanism and, and Galileo and Giordano Bruno, who argued for the plurality of worlds. You know, going back long before that, people did consider alien life, but it was very much in a supernatural or a philosophical way rather than a scientific approach. Um, when we realized that there were, you know, other stars, uh, and possibly planets around those other stars, then even then we didn't think too too much, too hard about it. It's always, as I said, like, you know, science fiction, the aliens in science fiction often reflect some aspect of, of humanity. And I think in the early ideas about life on other planets, it, it did the same. Percival Lowell, who famously thought he saw canals on Mars, he he dreamt up this whole idea of a, a dying civilization, you know, on a, on a desert planet, tr frantically trying to preserve what little water it has. But again, he was still very much thinking of, of human, you know, a, a human type civilization. Um, there was a great story um, about the Great Moon Hoax. Um, it was uh, in 1835 and it appeared in a New York newspaper called The Sun. And, and it was this hoax, hoax story that um, the British astronomer John Herschel had observed alien life on, on the surface of the moon. Now uh, let's dive you know, back into our discussion people, on you know, biography of people that look like by Dr. humans Muhammad but with bat wings <laughs> flying around. So, so some people actually believed it, um, and I think they asked, you know, they kept asking John Herschel about it, and I think it did his head in a little bit, you know, having to peel questions <laughs> about this hoax all the time. H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds, again, you know, life there, very predatory, um, very hostile. It, it's always reflected some, you know, part of, of human human culture. You know, 1950s science fiction, you know, the B-movies, it was very much a aliens were invading and it was a, a thinly veiled allegorism for, allegory for um, communism and, and the, the Soviet threat. Right, so, yeah. 
Yeah, so, 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 so it's always you know, reflected some part of us, uh, which I find really interesting because, you know, it, it's, it's like a, an insight into the way we think about ourselves and about life out there. And it's only, I mean, some science fiction certainly has explored life that isn't like us and doesn't behave like us. And, and now I think SETI and astrobiology uh, is beginning to catch up a little bit. But it, it's a little bit hard because you can only look for what you know. And you can, you know, completely make something up, but it's hard to look for, for something that you don't even know, you know, something so out there that you can't comprehend what it might behave like or, or what kind of technology it has. So I understand why SETI is a little bit parochial, but, you know, a data set of one, we have nothing to compare human life with. But by doing these thought experiments about what alien life might be like, then, you know, we... we, we kind of create these other data sets of imaginary ideas that we can then compare and contrast ourselves to. Now, what does, um, assuming, you know, SETI at some point succeeds and we were to make contact with an intelligent um, civilization, um, what could we expect from um, communication between the two? What 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 does our experience with with cultures different completely different cultures connecting uh with each other for the first time making first contact what, what can we uh extrapolate from that sure yeah um this is really highly sort of debated in in, in seti circles and unfortunately it, it tends to be um physicists and astronomers debating it rather than historians getting uh in, involved and it would be great to you know get historians and anthropologists and sociologists and evolutionary biologists involved to to, to um you know give their side of the story and, and and to inform and advise the debate um so let's look through history and one of the things i've learned from from looking at you know examples of contact between human societies and the consequences of that and then extrapolating what happened to what may happen if we make contact with uh, you know an, an alien civilization is the thing that I've learned is that contact events are complicated um, so you know the famous example is the Europeans going over to the Americas uh, and messing things up a little bit for the you know the people that lived over there uh, and the conquistadors are painted rather negatively as you know going over there and slaughtering everybody and and they certainly did a lot of that um, but at the same time it was disease that the Europeans brought over didn't realize they were bringing it over um, that also killed many millions of people you know if it, I was reading an article um, about what you know modern Mexicans feel about uh, Cortez um, and the conquistadors and you know there's some people you know hate the fact that it happened but other Mexicans are thankful that it happened because, you know, the Europeans introduced horses and coffee and Christianity and, and all these things that, you know, are very strong points of Mexican society today. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of mixed feelings about the consequences of that contact event. Um, but certainly at the time, it, it, you know, it didn't go well for, the, for you know, the indigenous population of, of, of uh, the Americas. You know, in other parts of the world, in, in Japan, uh, Japan was in the midst of a, a civil war um, about 500 years ago, I think. Um, European um, uh, traders, I think, introduced gunpowder uh, to Japan around that time, and that helped settle their civil war, as you might imagine. It, it can work the other way. Um, an example I use in my book is the story of tulip mania where I think it was the 1500s, tulips were introduced to the Netherlands. And, you know, they become really popular and people start, you know, breeding all kinds of tulip species that go for increasing amounts of money. And this whole mini economy builds up around, you know, this, you know people just want to buy tulip bulbs and grow tulips. Um, eventually that economic bubble crashed. It's been hyped up as, you know, you know, a major economic crash and lots of people basically going bankrupt. And I think the truth isn't that quite that dramatic. But it, it shows what, you know, that even something simple like a tulip, like a flower, could have an effect on society when it's introduced to the society for the first time. So you imagine we might, you know, meet 
um, or, or make contact with an extraterrestrial civilization, and they might send us a radio signal giving us, you know, information about some advanced technology that's great, but we don't know how that technology is going to affect our society. It could affect it very negatively. Um, I, I think some people, you know, hype up the idea that, you know, if, if we let, you know, an alien civilization know that we are here and that we exist, they may want to come and invade and conquer us. And, you know, like War of the Worlds on Independence Day. Uh, Stephen uh, Hawking said something to this effect. Yeah, yeah, he did. Um, I mean, we can't, we can't rule that out. But, it, you know, I think we're protected by, by distance. Uh, as I said, you know, certainly with our current understanding of physics, it would take, you know, several decades to reach even the nearest star and, you know, centuries to reach stars beyond that and, and, and millennia to reach stars on, on the other side of the galaxy. Um, so we're protected by distance, I think, um, in that sense. But, you know, even if even if we did make contact with an alien civilization and they were well-meaning, there's still scope for misunderstandings or disruptive technology or ideas to be introduced into our society. And we've seen that happen in previous contact events between human civilizations on Earth. Um, so there's a precedence there. And... You know, I don't think that has been studied enough in terms of um, its, you know, how it could inform uh, SETI contact. Uh, so, so you know, that's one of the things about where we could learn more about ourselves and our history by by doing SETI and, and, and by considering the consequences of SETI. I hope you're enjoying this episode on the contact paradox by Keith Cooper and thinking about what other life forms could be out there and the history of attempting to listen for them. I wanted to take a little break to tell you about the appropriately named website, Things From Another World. Things From Another World is a nerd and geek haven. They are a website that sells comic books, superhero memorabilia, graphic novels, collectibles, board games, and appropriate to the science fiction theme that we have today, they have a whole collection of Star Trek and Star Wars, Firefly, The Expanse, uh, graphic novels, comics, collectibles. So check them out. Right now they have free shipping on orders of $75 or more. If you want to check out things from another world and support this podcast, click on the link down below in the description of this episode in your podcast app. And then I'd like to tell you about another member of the Straight Up Strange podcast family. I'd like to introduce you to my friend, Canadian Girl, and her podcast, Nothing Ever Happens in Canada. Nothing Ever Happens in Canada is full of bizarre stories and interesting quirky history from um, our neighbors up north. And in line with today's theme that there could be other civilizations out there, she sprinkles in the occasional UFO story as well. Check out this promo for her show, and we'll get back to my conversation with Keith Cooper. Hello, and welcome to Nothing Ever Happens in Canada, and I'm Canadian Girl. Do you like adventures, myths, legends, and learning about some of Canada's greatest moments in history? Well then this is the podcast for you. Join me every two weeks as we travel around Canada exploring things like mermaids, giants, lost gold mines, and we even stop once in a while to observe historical events and people. Come on over to the channel and join the crew by hitting that subscribe button today. You don't want to miss out on our next adventure. By, by doing SETI and, and, and by considering the consequences of SETI. Yeah, conceivably there's, there's all kinds of, of ways that first contact could, could go. And, and as you've said, you know, science fiction really enjoys exploring that. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, while it, while it makes for fun literature or, you know, film or, or whatever medium, it, it does, you know, explore philosophically, you know, what these things could look like. Yeah. Yeah. Um... And, you know, and, and we can learn from science, the best science fiction, we can certainly learn from that. And, you know, a lot, of, a lot of the best science fiction is written by, by scientists or people with a lot of scientific knowledge. And, you know, and they, they do think carefully about what they're writing. And, you know, some science fiction authors are involved in SETI. Um, 
so so we can learn from you know from the very best of science fiction um you know it provides examples um imaginative examples but examples maybe rooted in science or in evolution evolution or biology you know and, and then we can consider those possibilities I, th- I think alien life is possibly stranger than even our best science fiction can imagine um we just don't know how it would have evolved if, if it even exists uh so i think we'll we, you know we potentially could be surprised we may not even recognize that life um upon first seeing it you know it could be completely outside of our field of experience you know, and, and, and we may not understand, you know, if it has technology, we may not understand what that technology does. I mean, you know, in, 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 in a lot of science fiction, the humans will meet an alien civilization and they'll have spaceships and we'll understand all the stuff that they have. Um, but, you know, think back to, you know, the, the cargo cults of the mid 20th century and, and you know, the Pacific Islands after uh, the U.S. military had abandoned uh, their bases uh, following the end of the war. You know, the, the, the indigenous people on that, those islands had watched the, the American military, you know, calling down airdrops and things. And they, then they tried to replicate that without understanding really what was going on. And it could very well be that, you know, if we encounter, you know, uh, a technologically advanced civilization, we may not have a clue how their technology works or what they're doing. Um, and we may try and copy it and... You know, it might not work, or it might lead to disaster, or, or a huge misunderstanding. Like the universe is 13.8 billion years old. Um, that's a heck of a long time. And, and you know, the materials for forming planets and for forming life have been around for you know maybe 10 billion of those years. Um, Earth is four and a half billion years old, and you know, human life is what? I mean, if we're going back, you know. Modern human life is what maybe a hundred thousand years old. Um, right. Our ancestors a couple million years old. Alien life could have evolved billions of years before our planet even formed. So, you know, they could be way ahead of us technologically. And I have to be careful here because I keep saying advanced. And when when, when SETI scientists refer to an advanced civilization, they're talking about advanced technology. We have no idea whether their morals or ethics will be advanced or, or their culture or how we would even measure if that is if it's advanced or not um so i've got to be a little bit careful when i when i use that phrase culture studies yeah you try to avoid terms like yes. advanced or primitive yeah yes um but but that's what they mean when you know if you hear city scientists talk about a an advanced civilization they mean technologically advanced certainly nothing else uh, there's this oh, it, it's it's a huge assumption it, it's wishful thinking i i, I believe that Alien civilizations, if they exist, will be so much older than us and so much technologically advanced than us that they will have somehow reached this state of of being perfectly altruistic and peaceful and kindly. And it's almost, you know, I think it's making the mistake that just because science and technology progresses, that their culture will progress at the same time. You know, and, and, and that's, I don't think there's any evidence for that at all. Um, you know, in, in life here, here on earth if you look at our history you know we've invented all kinds of technology and all we seem to do with it is is come up with new ways to kill each other um so you know an advanced technolo- technologically advanced civilization could you know have some very dark morals or some very dark ethics I, also- I was i was puzzled by that philosophical argument too that if if a civilization is going to be long lasting it has to jettison its its worst impulses to survive i i don't really see evidence of that in in human culture no not at all um and and that's you know maybe i mean you know i mentioned existential risk and all the ways we can wipe ourselves out and maybe that's what life ends up doing maybe that's inevitable that that you know we will invent a technology that will wipe ourselves out whether it's a nuclear weapon or you know an artificially produced pandemic um, or you know, climate collapse, or, or something else. Um, but you know, th- there's this idea in SETI that, that that alien life, because it'll be older than us, um, will be will be perfectly altruistic. But that's that's misunderstanding. I think what altruism is. Um, when we look in nature, we see two main types of altruism. Uh, there's kin altruism, where where life forms are altruistic to their kin. 
um, you know, they look out for their sons, daughters, nieces, nephews, because it helps propagate their genes through the, you know, to the next generation. Um, the other kind of altruism is a kind of a quid pro quo, where you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours, which is kind of how the world works, you know, based on trade, you know, and, and, and things like that. So that that's fine. But when you consider interstellar distances and, and you know, the time it takes for, for signals to get from one planet to another and what have you, I, I can't see how either of those forms of altruism will, will, will dominate. I mean, they're not akin. You know, by the very definition, they would be alien. Um, and, you know, it, because it would take so long for messages to get backwards and forwards, it would be impossible to trade. So that quid pro quo would be, well, it wouldn't be impossible to trade, but it would make it difficult. And, you know, would a, a civilization spend a lot of money and resources sending out messages left, right and center with no guarantee that they're ever going to get a reply. So that, that kind of altruism wouldn't necessarily work either. They'd have to have a huge leap of faith that there would be somebody out there to, to reply and, and to you know fulfill their side of the quid pro quo. So, so yeah, we, we don't know what alien life will be like. Um, we don't know how it would act towards us. Uh, we, all we know based on human history is that, that the contact could be a very complex affair, you know, potentially dangerous. Um, just from the point of view of misunderstandings and disruptive ideas and technology uh, being introduced into into our civilization, maybe theirs as well. You know, maybe maybe we would um, export you know some of our religion to to them that could end up being disruptive to their society. So it's not necessarily a one way stream either, which I think history has also shown. Uh, that's a good point. There's all kinds of of ideas from humanity, negative ideas that could go back the other way. Mm -hmm. um, now, we've, we've talked a lot so far um, about uh, listening, about receiving communications from extraterrestrial civilizations, but have there been any attempts to preemptively contact other worlds? There have. Um, I mean, the most famous was uh, in the 1970s, um, using the, the, the big Arecibo telescope in Puerto Rico, uh, when the astronomer Frank Drake uh, beamed a signal uh, to a star cluster um, about 50,000 light years away. It was more, mostly a publicity stunt for, you know, the reopening of, of, of the observatory. Um, but Frank Drake was, was the, you know, he's one of the forefathers of, of, of SETI. He did the first radio SETI experiment, so he had an interest in that as well. Um, you know, it'll take 50,000 years to reach the star cluster and then another 50,000 years to, to receive a reply. There have been some uh, attempts since using uh, uh, te telescopes targeting uh, uh, some nearby stars. It, it's debatable whether those signals are strong enough to be able to be heard at those uh, 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 nearby stars. Um, but yeah, this is, oh, I mean, goodness, this has really, you know, uh, created a split in the SETI community because there's, you know, on one side, you've got some scientists who really favor doing this because they think, well, maybe, you know, alien civilizations are a bit reticent about sending out signals. So why don't we send out signals and let them know we're here? Um, but then on the other side, you have people, you know, hang on a minute. We don't know anything about what life might be like, you know, out there you know we don't walk into the jungle and start shouting for all the lions and tigers and what have you to you know to come and and and, and get us so so there's a huge debate um about whether it's safe to to even do this um i, I guess you know it'd be the equivalent of you know the native americans sending up smoke signals uh, saying to the europeans here we are here we are come and get us um and we, we really don't know how how you know an alien civilization would behave so you know, it, it's going back to this assumption, this hopeful assumption that aliens are going to be altruistic and they're going to be wise. Um, and, you know, as we've seen, there's, there's no reason to believe that they would be. Um, so personally, I'm a little bit against sending out messages uh, until we know a little bit more about what's out there, just based on, you know, looking at human history and seeing that all, the, all the, the, the challenges that people have faced when civilizations have, have come into contact with one another. It makes a lot of sense. Maybe, maybe not draw too much attention to ourselves. Yeah, I, I mean, obviously, you know, the ultimate aim of SETI is is to make contact. Um, so at some point, you you know, you're going to want to reach out. But I, I think, you know, there's no rush. 
Um, you know, we don't even know if anybody's out there. So why not try and and find out if there's anybody out there first by doing SETI, by listening. But also, you know, astronomers are discovering planets around other stars. Um, in the next couple of decades, we're going to have large telescopes that are going to be able to potentially um, discover whether whether any of those planets are, are habitable, uh, maybe even detect evidence of biological activity on those planets. And we're going to get a much better idea of, you know, whether there is any life on, on, on nearby stars. Uh, and then maybe, you know, if we do identify a planet that has life, uh, maybe we can observe it and, and study it and then consider um, reaching out to them if they don't reach out to us first. So, you know, it, it, I would just urge caution and, and, and let's let's explore the universe a little bit before we start going out there and shouting. Now, on that note of, of exploration, um, you know, this idea of other planets is um, seemingly the hot issue in astronomy right now. You have uh, NASA's Kepler space mi mission, the TESS uh, space mission, where they're just cataloging thousands and thousands of exoplanets. Um, yeah. Where does SETI fit into all that? Um, SETI is, is quite closely tied to that because... Um, so there's this notion of a habitable zone around stars, which is this distance from a star where temperatures on a planet would be just right for liquid water to survive, uh, to, to, to exist on, on, on the surface of that planet, uh, like it does here on Earth. And to the best of our knowledge, life needs water um, to survive. Um, so we call it the habitable zone, and we're starting to find planets in the habitable zone of, of, of other stars. So... Uh, scientists are drawing up a list of these habitable zone planets and, and, and starting to, to listen to them with radio telescopes to see if there's any life there um, sending out signals. Um, and, and the more planets we find, you know, you mentioned the test spacecraft, that's going to be, you know, looking at the nearest, brightest stars, you know, potentially could find habitable planets. Um, so, so, yeah, it gives them, because, you know, we, we, we're talking how many stars in the galaxy, you know, hundreds of billions. You know, we can't search all of them, so we need to narrow down the search. And, and you know, the search for exoplanets is allowing us to do that. So one really exciting discovery recently has been uh, planets around the nearest star to the sun, Proxima Centauri, which is just 4.2 light years away. Uh, a couple of years ago, they, they found one planet uh, very close to, to the star, um, but because the star is quite cool, the planet was actually in the habitable zone. Um, so it could potentially be habitable. And recently, astronomers think they may have directly imaged another planet around Proxima Centauri. So, you know, pl we're finding planets around, you know, the closest stars to, to our solar system, and they're ripe for exploration. And, and who knows what's there? Yeah, it's a very exciting time in, in astronomy. Absolutely. I mean, I mean, I feel privileged to be alive during this time. You know, in terms of astronomical history, I think the 20th century was was a remarkable period. You know, we had Edwin Hubble, you know, discovering that there were galaxies beyond our galaxy and that the universe was expanding. And that, you know, broadened our cosmic horizons, you know, the discovery of the cosmic microwave background and the Big Bang. Um, it's transformed the way we view the universe and our place in the universe. And I think SETI is, is a part of this. It, it's, you know, it's this idea of, of finding cosmic context for, for ourselves um, and you know it's kind of an awakening to, to where we fit in um, you know in the universe at large um, and, and you know we're just continuing that and, and hopefully this century will will have you know just as many revelatory discoveries about about the universe you know about the Big Bang um, and you know about the, the laws of physics and, and, and about life and where we fit into all that and how cool would it be if you know, we did discover in our interstellar neighborhood uh, some intelligent civilization that we send a that we receive a communication from, and we can respond. It, um, you know, the 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 Drake um, uh, publicity stunt you mentioned, sending something fifty thousand light years away—that's not really helpful. But if you know, it takes four to ten years to send a message back and forth. That's uh, somewhat yeah. noble. Absolutely. I mean, I mean, even you know, going out to stars twenty light years away, you know, that forty years uh, round round trip for a radio signal. Um, so yeah, you know, you, you could 
detect a message, send a reply, receive something back within our lifetimes. It would be really exciting, you know, for, you know, with the fulfillment of, of SETI. How, what, you know, what kind of consequences that would have for us, we'd have to wait and see. I mean, you know, if we discovered alien life on a faraway star, um, you know, it hasn't come here, it can't come here, you know, it's just sending, you know, messages backwards and forwards. I don't know whether society in general will be, all right, there'd be an initial excitement, but long term, because it would, wouldn't have any consequences for, for people in their everyday lives. I don't know how how much of an effect it would have on, on our life, but if through contact, you know, new technology or new ideas are introduced, you know, they could have a profound effect, both positive and negative. We don't know. Um, but it would certainly be an exciting time. And, you know, it would, I think, would be part of, you know, our growing up in terms of, of you know, as I said before, understanding our context in the universe and, and becoming a more mature civilization, which I think, you know, we need to do. We need to start thinking of, of ourselves as one planet and one species. Um, and, you know, we are going to be faced by a lot of uh, trials and tribulations of the, you know, the coming centuries, things, war, disease, poverty, uh, climate, um, technological advances that, you know, we may, like artificial intelligence that we may not know how to handle. Um, so, you know, discovering life out there could, could just give us a new perspective on things and uh, whether they would you know, be able to offer us advice or help. I mean, I mean, we'd have to get past the language barrier first because um, we wouldn't, you know, we may not even be able to decipher their message. Their culture could be so different to us, their language, we wouldn't have any kind of Rosetta Stone to decode their language. On the other hand, if, you know, if they are fairly close, they may have already picked up our TV and radio signals, although they'd be pretty weak that far out, but it's possible they could have, and they may already know a little bit about us. Um, so hopefully they've been picking up, um, uh, shall we say, the better TV programs than some of the, some of the other ones. Um, well, very good. Uh, all you know, these are all really fun things to to think about, and and definitely there's a lot of internal implications for us as as a people. Um, I, I guess the last thing I wanted to to get your take on is. Um, uh, do you think there's life out there, or do, you, or do you think we are indeed alone in the universe? The heart wants to say yes. The head says, I don't know. I mean, you know, interest in SETI, scientists doing SETI, uh, you know, to, at some level, you know, you have to have a little bit of faith that there is somebody else out there. Um, I, I, I go backwards and forwards on this, and I end up sitting on the fence a little bit. You know, it's a either, one. yeah, and I think Arthur C. Clarke said it best that you know either either possibility is terrifying. You know, if we're alone, that's terrifying, um, because you know, as I said earlier, there'd be a whole you know a huge amount of responsibility on our shoulders and um, nobody to help us if things go wrong. On the other hand, you know, if we aren't alone, there is other life out there. Then you know, this whole issue of contact and what it may be like and you know, will it be hostile? Will it be peaceful? We don't know. That's, you know, that unknown aspect is, is equally terrifying. It, I think, would make us grow up as a, as a species, as a, a civilization. It'd be, it'd be an exciting time, and, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd love it to happen. But, um, you know, it, it, the universe is, is the way the universe is, and just because we wish something to happen uh, doesn't mean it, it will. So, um, so we'll see. Um, but, you know, we, we shouldn't. You know, we shouldn't hope that we find alien life so that it can solve all our problems. We, we need to solve our problems ourselves. Um, but the discovery of it and, and the study of, of human history and human culture um, as part of that search could also enlighten us, um, you know, into in, in making us a, a, better, a better people. Um, and certainly understanding where we've come from a little bit better. Um, so I think there's lots to be learned. Even if you don't believe there's life out there, I think SETI is still extremely worthwhile. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's had a bad rep because um, people do equate it with, with flying saucers and things or, you know, because we haven't discovered anything yet that, you know, people get disheartened. But I think they're looking at it wrong. I think, you know, I think by looking at it, for, you know, 
in terms of what we can learn about ourselves in the process, you know, it's it, it, it could be really fruitful. So, yeah, um, I, you know, I, I think it's worthwhile. I, I think there's a lot to be learned. I learned a ton, you know, writing the book, and, and hopefully um, readers will also learn a lot as well and, and go on to, you know, and to investigate, you know, some of the things I talk about in the book and, and maybe learn more and, and maybe help contribute to the, you know, the to the debate, to the process of learning, and 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 to, to, to the search, and and we'll see what happens. Yeah, um, I uh, you know I definitely I loved your book. Um, I thought it was you know very thoughtful, and um, you know I learned a lot, and it was very deep in places. It, it's a very contemplative uh, subject. Thank thank you, and I'm glad that that you you know you enjoyed it. One of my aims was to make it a book that you know non seti people could also find interesting um and, and, you know, and i've seen comments and heard comments from people who have no interest in, in science generally but they read the book and, and they understood it and they loved it and, and, and that's fantastic so um it just shows that you know there's a lot a lot that seti has to offer to all kinds of people um from historians and anthropologists and sociologists and you know just the common person on this on the street um could learn things from it and I, I you know i think we need to start bringing all those people in to the SETI community because you know the search for extraterrestrial life isn't just a you know isn't just relevant to, to scientists it's relevant to all of us um so if someone if, if a listener uh wanted to uh, pick up a copy of the contact paradox or learn more about you and and your work uh where can they go Okay, so you can follow me on Twitter uh, at 21st Century SETI. I'm also hopefully um, going to launch my own personal website soon. That's uh, going to be 21stCenturySETI.com, but it's it's I'm still building it, so it's not uh, available just yet. Uh, the book should be available in all good bookshops, um, uh, Amazon or, or, or wherever. Um, uh, there's also an audio book from Tantor Media. Um, so if people like audiobooks, then, then that's available. It's, it's uh, been read excellently by Matthew Waterson. And yeah, it's published by Bloomsbury Sigma. Um, it's available in the UK and the US, and I believe you can get it in other parts of the world as well. Uh, there's going to be a Japanese edition. I'm not, I'm not sure when that comes out. But yeah, it, it, it's, it, it's out there and people are enjoying it. And I hope, um, hope all the listeners will, um, will search it out and enjoy it as well. All right, Keith. Well, this has been uh, a lot of fun. Thank you so much for coming on today. Thank you very much. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy day to listen to this episode of Can't Make This Up. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Keith Cooper. Uh, If you're interested in checking out his book, The Contact Paradox, Challenging Our Assumptions in the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, I have provided a link to his book down in the description of this episode in your podcast app. As always, I'll ask you if you enjoyed today's episode or you've been enjoying the podcast in general, uh, head on over to wherever you listen to this and please leave a five-star review. Uh, Please subscribe so you can stay tuned as we do episodes in the future. Uh, Both of those things are extremely helpful in getting word of the podcast out and about. If you would like to connect on social media, you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. All of them are at CMTU History. Feel free to drop me a line and let me know what you think of the podcast. All right, that's it for this episode. Stay tuned for next time. We will be joined by best-selling author Kate Moore to talk about her book, Radium Girls. See you then. This podcast is a part of Straight Up Strange Productions. Discover more shows like this one at straightupstrange.com.